It's a four-digit code that we've all come to rely on. But now, fresh questions over whether chip and pin is really that secure. We have to question the, the entire uh, architecture uh, that surrounds chip and pin. It really is time for um, a closer look to be taken at this whole area. But this floor is really a whopper. It's only been up and running since 2004, yet paying by chip and pin is now an integral part of our lives. Most of us pretty much take for granted that chip and pin is secure, and the banks seem to say that too. But is this system really as reliable as it can be? We've been speaking to a team of computer scientists who think it's not. Over the past few years, the Cambridge team has uncovered a series of weaknesses in the chip and pin system. Two years ago, we featured one on Newsnight, showing that criminals could create a cloned card. Now, the same team has found a way round the chip and pin system that's so simple, it shocked even them. Well, we think this is one of the biggest flaws um, that we've ever uncovered, that has ever been uncovered against payment systems. And, you know, I've been in this business 25 years. This is um, a flaw on a system that's used by hundreds of millions of people, by tens of thousands of banks, by millions of merchants. So how does the attack work? Essentially what it does is exploit a flaw in the chip and pin system that allows the terminal to think that a correct pin was entered and the card to think that a signature authorized the transaction. So at the end, the receipt says verified by pin. The bank is going to think that the pin was entered correctly, but uh, the criminal actually did not know the pin. Cambridge University gave us permission to see if the attack works in real life. The team set up in one of the university's cafeterias. We obviously don't want to give out too much detail, but in simple terms, SAR is hooking up the stolen card to a chip. This is controlled from a laptop and runs software written by the team. All of this is hooked up to a fake card which slots into the actual shop terminal. The kit wouldn't have to be this big. The team's already working on miniaturising it into a unit the size of a remote control. Saar has a trick up his sleeve. His dummy card has a concealed cable running up his arm to the kit in his backpack. So will it work? He doesn't need to know the actual pin from the stolen card. Any combination should do. The stolen card is getting a message that the purchase has been authorised by signature. This mismatch should allow the transaction to go ahead. And yes, it does. The printout states it's been verified by pin. In fact, Saar tried a handful of high street debit and credit cards, keying in 0000, 000 as the pin, and it worked every time. The team tried out four common cards. Two credit cards issued by HSBC and John Lewis, and two debit cards issued by Barclays and the Co-op Bank. There was no particular reason for choosing these cards. They just happened to be the ones in the Newsnight team's wallets. The co-op bank said this is an industry issue which is not specific to the cooperative bank. Our chip and pin debit and credit cards are no different to that of any other provider. Barclays told us whilst the prevention and detection of fraud is of course a major priority for Barclays, this is an industry issue and is not specific to any card, provider or bank. HSBC said although they have raised a clear security concern with regards to chip and pin, which we're taking very seriously, the problem highlighted is relevant to all card issuers and not just HSBC. HSBC also administered the John Lewis credit card. The three banks referred us to the Banking Trade Association for further comment. The Cambridge researchers have a standard approach when they uncover this kind of flaw. They tell the authorities straight away, suggest fixes and then publish. In the last few weeks, they've told the relevant official bodies. But in reality, how easy would it be for someone without a PhD in computer science to carry out this attack? Even small-scale small 
criminal operations have better equipment than what we have. And the amount of technical sophistication needed to carry out this attack is really quite low. In practice, how this attack would be used is that one reasonably technically skilled person would build a device that carries out the attack, and they would then sell this equipment on the internet, just like criminals already do, and these would be distributed to less skilled people who don't understand how the attack works, but they take the risks and actually use it in practice. So is this attack happening in the real world? The Consumers Association thinks Chip and Pin has helped to bring down instances of card crime, but many cases remain unexplained. It's very difficult to quantify exactly how big this problem is. What we do know from our um, investigations is that, say, around 14% of, of, of consumers on a representative basis will have said that they have suffered some kind of um, financial loss, which they believe is through fraud. The percentage of that which is actually from th uh, this type of potential problem with chip and pin is something that's a lot less clear. What we do know is that we do have cases that are brought forward from individuals which seem quite persuasive. In America, they're thinking of bringing in chip and pin too. And the Federal Reserve has invited one of the Cambridge team to talk to them about how secure they think it is. But judging by the title of their paper, they've pretty much made up their minds. Chip and pin is broken. So whose job is it to sort this out? Every time you use a card, data on the transaction is generated along the way. The Cambridge team thinks that customers would be better protected if banks were forced to produce this entire audit trail in disputed transactions. In practice, banks often ask customers to destroy their card, and therefore its chip, as soon as they report a problem. Just because verified by PIN is printed on a piece of paper which comes out of a machine proves nothing. It, it's for the bank to prove that it was verified by PIN, and that statement is actually totally irrelevant. So this is why they need to produce evidence of the uh, counter in the card to see if the counter in the card is uh, roughly equivalent to the count number of transactions that the card has done throughout its entire history, for instance. In November last year, the law changed, placing the onus firmly on the banks to prove that a customer has been negligent in any dispute. In the UK, it's the FSA, or the Financial Services Authority, which has responsibility for overseeing how that new law works in practice. Though they say it's up to the industry itself to decide how best to comply. The chip and pin system has a 700-odd page manual, but the Cambridge team says it has so many holes in it, the whole thing should be rewritten, but with outside scrutiny so that next time any bugs are found before consumers have to rely on the system. I think the first thing that banks should do is fix this vulnerability. There are ways for them to upgrade the chip and pin system which would prevent this attack working for most of the transactions that happen in the UK. Not all, but most. They should also look back at previous transactions where the customer says that there are PIN had not been used and the bank record show it has, and consider refunding these customers because it could be that they are a victim of this type of fraud. We understand that behind the scenes, some of the banks are already working on fixing this flaw, but they obviously haven't all fixed it yet, because the banks didn't alert any of us to the purchases we made using the Cambridge attack, our cards, and a PIN. Zero, 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 zero.